God's mercies are new every morning. Every mercy you enjoy is a drop obtained from the ocean of God's goodness. I believe with all my heart in the goodness of God, and I trust that every true believer here today believes in the goodness of God. Unbelievers and doubters do not believe in the goodness of God because they cannot bring themselves to believe in a God who sent the great flood, who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, who called for the elimination of the Amorites, who allowed his own son to die on a cross, who permits, in their way of thinking, wars, suffering, accidents, and most of all, a God who sends people in their way of thinking to hell. Many of these same people never give thanks to God for each breath they take, each beat of their heart, each sunrise or sunset they see, each bite of food they take, each good thing they experience and enjoy in life, which would include the blessings of rainfall, sunshine, healing, wellness, sleep at night, because they have been injected and infected with the poison of distrust. As someone said, sin is ever seeking to inject that poison into our hearts to distrust the goodness of God. But where does all the good in this world come from if not from God? Our brother James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Light itself is a good gift from God. Without it, we would live in a spiritual Stygian darkness. But in fact, light was the very first gift God gave to mankind, and that is because God himself is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is the one who truly lights up our life. First of all, this morning, I want to establish the fact that God is good. God is one, or goodness is one of God's many attributes. Psalm 107 verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good, and his love endures forever. Amen. This psalm exalts the goodness of God. He redeemed Israel from their enemies. He delivered them from distress. Verse 7 says, He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. He satisfied their thirst. He filled the hungry with good food. And even when they sinned and rebelled, God heard their cries and saved them. And so the psalmist declares in verse 21, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. God indeed was good to Israel. Verses 35 through 38 say, He turned the desert into pools of water. You try that sometime. God did that because he loved Israel. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs, and there he brought the hungry to live. And they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yield a fruitful harvest. He blessed them and their numbers increased. And this great chapter, Psalm 107, closes, Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. If you are wise today, whether you're young or old, you will choose to believe that God is good. The wicked, in contrast, shut their mouths, verse 42, because they cannot for one moment acknowledge the goodness of God because then they have to acknowledge the existence of God. And if God exists, then there is someone to whom they must give an account for their behavior. So David declares in Psalm 31, 19, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. 
The goodness of God is clearly seen in the opening chapters of the Bible. Everything that God created is pronounced to be good. In fact, the word good appears seven times in Genesis 1. And the final reference, verse 31, says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. He created the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 2, verse 17. The only thing God declared not to be good was in regard to man being alone. And so God made a helper suitable for man, and this was good. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I think in the old King James Version it says he finds a good thing. I once performed a wedding for a great big tall Dutchman and an American girl. And when they came back from their honeymoon in Holland, Cornelius gave a testimony in our sharing time at church. The theme that night was the goodness of God. And Cor raised his big hand and said, I have got me a wife. <laughs> he who finds a wife has found a good thing. But despite all this goodness, Adam and Eve chose to listen to bad advice, bad counsel, bad teaching, false doctrine. And as a result of their bad choice, they were banished forever from the most beautiful and the safest place ever known on earth, the Garden of Eden. Jerry Bridges says, the first temptation in the history of mankind was the temptation to be discontented, and discontentment is a questioning of the goodness of God. The goodness of God is a foundational truth. It may even be, if I may say so, the sum total of all of God's attributes. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses asked God a question. Now show me your glory. And how does God show him his glory? Look at verse 19. God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. In fact, God had to place Moses in a cleft of the rock. And yes, that's where that song comes from, and I'll say more about that later. And cover him with his own hand until all his goodness had passed by. It is impossible to have goodness without God. You cannot separate what is good from God. In fact, you cannot even spell good without including God in the word. But God alone is good, and Jesus said so. He told the rich young man, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Amen. And David understood this perfectly. He said in Psalm 16, 2, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and apart from you I have no good thing. Amen. Paul very candidly confessed, I know that nothing good lives in me. Romans 7, 18, and I think in the KJV it says, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing thing. Apart from God, there is no true goodness. Now, our godless culture today seeks mightily to separate good from God. Especially do we see this in modern education. But you cannot teach values, morality, right and wrong apart from God. God is the gold standard of goodness. How does one know what is right or wrong or moral or worthy apart from what God has said in his holy word? Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So back to our text, James 1, 17. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father. That's how it reads 
in the New Living Translation. And here is the truly good thing about our good God, who is also our Father. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. A good father does not withhold good things from his children, nor does he give them evil things. And Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Matthew 7 and verse 11. Second point I want to share with you this morning is the relevance of God's goodness. We've seen the fact of it throughout Scripture. But just how does the fact that God is good intersect with and direct my daily living? God is good. So what? How is this relevant to my everyday life? Believing in the goodness of God, first of all, helps us understand God in all his fullness because everything, and I mean everything about God, is good. His love, mercy, compassion, righteousness, holiness, all good, all well and good. But what about God's wrath, severity, judgments, and punishment? Do we reject those attributes simply because we don't like them or are not willing to accept them as a part of who God is? For example, Hebrews 12, 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Do we accept that? That is a quotation from Deuteronomy 4, 24, which also tells us that our God is is a jealous God. Those who believe and live in the knowledge that God is everything Scripture claims Him to be are standing not on holy ground but on solid ground. And those who only want a God of their picking and choosing and imagination are sinking in quicksand. Please notice the context of Hebrews 12 and verse 29. It begins in verse 28 which says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Now the context of Deuteronomy 4, where this quotation originates, is God warning Israel that when they would enter that good land which he was giving them, not to forget the covenant he had made with them and not to make for themselves idols of any kind. When we make God a God of our own choosing and imagination, that is idolatry, perhaps in the worst form. The question of evil and suffering often arises in this culture if God is good, why does he permit evil to happen? Why does he allow suffering? And so people say, I can't believe or I no longer believe in a God who would allow bad things to happen to good people. But what about a God who brings just punishment to evil men for what they did to innocent people. It absolutely amazes me that some people are so quick to harshly contemn God for what happened at Auschwitz, but then give God no credit at all for the justice that took place at Nuremberg, where high-ranking Nazi officials were tried, sentenced, and justly punished for their crimes against humanity. You can't have it both ways. <laughs> God allowed Satan to touch everything that Job had, but then he blessed the latter part of Job's life more than he did the first. And Joseph magnanimously says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but 
God meant it for good. And even Paul makes another candid confession. To keep me from being conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, get ready for this, a messenger of Satan to torment me. God allows nothing to happen to his dear children that is not for their ultimate good. Now we know this, Paul says, and we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then Paul concludes that great eighth chapter of Romans by reminding us that nothing in all creation, angels, demons, or any powers, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God is always working for our good. Even in circumstances and events that at the time seem bad to us, like Job losing all his children, like Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, like Paul even receiving from Satan a thorn in the flesh. But it was for his good to keep him from becoming conceited because of the surpassing revelations that God had given to him. Jack Heil said, if you can't see God's goodness, you can still trust his goodness. Sometimes it's hard for us to see that God is good when things bad are happening to us, but you can still trust that God is good. R.C. Sproul says, if God is able to make everything that happens to us work together for our good, then ultimately everything that happens to us is good. We must be careful to use the word ultimately. On the earthly plane, things that happen to us may indeed be evil. Yet God in his goodness, says Sproul, transcends all these things and works them out to our good. For the Christian, ultimately, there are no tragedies. Ultimately. Now, the story is told about Dr. Dwight Pentecost, who once asked his class to pray for his wife, just as we prayed for the wife of Boyce Moton today. She had some cancer-like symptoms, and he was very concerned about his wife, as you and I would be as well. So he asked the students to pray. And then when the reports came back a few days later, that the reports were negative, that she didn't have cancer, some of the students said, God is good. And Dr. Pentecost smiled and said, yes, God is good, but men, I have to say to you that if the doctor's report had been that my wife had cancer, God is still good. Amen. You see, God is good even when things don't go the way we want them to go or think, the way, or think they should go. So let no one charge God foolishly. Job didn't, and neither should we. Charles Spurgeon offered this advice, Christian, remember the goodness of God in the frost of adversity. And we have all been frostbitten by adverse things in life. Maybe some of you even this day, though it's 80 degrees outside, are suffering that frost burn. But always remember the goodness of God. Spurgeon went on to say, when others behave badly to us, it should only stir us up the more heartily to give thanks unto the Lord because he is good. And when we ourselves are conscious that we are far from being good, we should only the more reverently bless him that he is good. We must never tolerate an instant's unbelief as to the goodness of the Lord. Whatever else may be questioned, it is absolutely certain that God is good. His dispensations may vary, but his nature is always the same. 
God is good. A.W. Pink said, there are seasons in the lives of all when it is not easy, no, not even for Christians, to believe that God is still faithful and that God is good. Our faith is sorely tried. Our ears be, tim be dimmed with tears. We can no longer trace the outworkings of his love. Our ears are distracted with the noises of the world, harassed by the atheistic whisperings of Satan, and we can no longer hear the sweet accents of his still small voice. Cherished plans have been thwarted. Friends on whom we relied have failed us. A professed brother or sister in Christ has betrayed us. We are staggered. We sought to be faithful to God, and now a dark cloud hides him from us. We find it difficult, yea, impossible, for carnal reason to harmonize his frowning providence with his gracious promises. And then he concludes, ah, faltering soul, severely tried fellow pilgrim, seek grace to heed and understand Isaiah 50 verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. And we do all that because God is good. Third, finally, and perhaps most importantly, the goodness of God is best seen in the gospel. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. You see, the gospel is good news. It is glad tidings. It is the best news the world has ever heard or ever will hear. The English word gospel comes from the Anglo-Saxon Godspell, which means good tidings or literally the God story. It is the message the angel of the Lord announced one starry night 2,000 years ago, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now let me spend a little time in closing here in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah with its 66 chapters is a miniature Bible. Chapter 40 is the hinge point. Some scholars divide the book into two major sections, the book of judgment, chapters 1 through 39, and the book of comfort, books, chapters 40 through 66. And so at this hinge point, where it, 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 it transfers from, from the, uh, the uh, judgment of God to the comfort of God, it starts like this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. Her sin has been paid for and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Look at verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Zion. Go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Listen to Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. And just one more of many I could include. Isaiah 61.1, quoted by Christ himself in a synagogue in Capernaum. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. One has to understand 
the bad news before they can appreciate the good news. I have bad news for you today, but I also have good news for you. First, the bad news. All have sinned. The Jew has sinned. The Gentile has sinned. You and I have sinned. All have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous, no, not one. And the wrath of God is being, present tense, revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men. That's bad, bad, bad news. But there is good news. There was good news for those in Thessalonica. Paul told them, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he died for us, whether we are awake or asleep, that we may live together with him. And there was also good news for those in the city of Corinth. Paul told them, Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There was good news for those in Rome. For the wages of sin is death, Paul wrote to them. But then in the same verse he says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there is good news for those in the city of Joplin, Missouri today. Our good friend and late brother Don DeWelt wrote a gospel tract and called it, Someone Died and Left You a Fortune. Well, that's good news. Someone loved you enough to die for you, and then he left you a fortune. Who wants to be a millionaire? You already are in Christ Jesus, because Jesus died and left you a fortune. So in him and because of him, I have today pardon, I have peace, I have provision, and I have protection. I am the richest man in Joplin, Missouri today. And so are you if you have heard and believed and obeyed this God story, the gospel, the message that Christ Jesus died for our sins. That's good, all good, good news. In 1902, Dr. E.T. Cassell and his wife Flora sat down one afternoon and composed a song that is still sung today, a song I still believe with all my heart and do my best to practice both at home and abroad. I am a stranger here within a foreign land. <laughs> my home is far away upon a golden strand Ambassador to be of realms beyond the sea, I'm here on business for my king. And this is the message that I bring, a message angels fain would sing. Oh, be ye reconciled, thus says my Lord and King, oh, be ye reconciled to God. For this is the king's command, that all men everywhere repent and turn away from sin's seductive snare, that all who will obey with him shall reign for a, and that's my business for my king. And that's why Paul wrote as he did when he said, this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Today is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. So God is calling us today, right now, by his own glory and goodness. I remember when I was a boy, the first song that ever reached my heart was this one. God is calling the prodigal. Come without delay. Hear, oh, hear him calling, calling now for thee. And when I heard that word thee, I know that meant me. It was an evening service. My own father was preaching. I remember the darkness outside and the light of the church house inside somewhere on the prairie of Nebraska. And I can remember that occasion as though it were only yesterday. 
Outside was the darkness, and I was out there in the darkness. But in this house where the light of the gospel was being preached and where this song was being sung, I felt strangely drawn to that light, and I wanted to be a part of that light. This is a dark and wicked world, and it's becoming more wicked and evil and desperate and dark and dangerous with each passing day, and that's because Satan knows that his time is short. Do you realize that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repent, just as it did me as a little boy out there on the prairies of Nebraska? God has been good to you so that you can accept his goodness. And I urge you to find refuge in him. Someday you will want him and need him to place you in that cleft of the rock for your protection for what's coming down the pike. And let me tell you, it's not going to be pretty. And you need to be found in the cleft of the rock. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin, the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. The goodness of God that will pass in front of us will also protect us from the reach of the evil one who seeks to separate us from the love of God. And remember God's promise to Moses. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand. God's glory is found only in God's goodness. And you are safe in the cleft of the rock. And that rock is Christ. Rock of ages, cleft for me and for you. God bless you.